Well, today we will be looking at some of the many questions and hang-ups that people have about the gifts of the Spirit. So, gifts of the Spirit, questions and hang-ups. God placed the gifts of the Spirit within the church to benefit the people of the church as well as those outside of the church. In uh, some cases, Paul, according to Paul, the gifts also serve as a sign to unbelievers. And that's found in 1 Corinthians 14.22. It is also noted that by willingly allowing the gifts of the Spirit to operate through us is part of our learning how to be led by the Holy Spirit. So allowing the gifts to operate through us is part of our learning process as Christians. There is just so much that could be taught about the gifts of the Spirit. God does not want us to be ignorant of what He has made available to us. God made these gifts available to the believers, to the Christian, and He does not want us to be ignorant or in misunderstanding concerning the gifts of the Spirit. So today I will only touch on an, uh, 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 and examine only a few of the potential questions that people may ask about these precious gifts. For we are to recognize the gifts of the Spirit as being precious, for they are heaven sent. God did not have to make the, this power available to the church, but He did because He loves us so and wants the best for us. God desires for us to be effective in our witness for the kingdom and the gifts help us to do just that. Let us get started with some questions and hang-ups concerning the gifts of the Spirit. Question, why are the gifts not manifested through some people? Why is it that, that would some people the gifts of the Spirit are not manifested through them. Now, I've come up with five reasons. There's probably maybe more, but uh, I came up with five reasons why the gifts are not manifested through some people. We will start uh, with the most obvious answer. It may be that they are not Christians. Simply the fact that they're not a Christian. Only Christians are granted these giftings of power. One must commit their life to Christ. Going to church, praying, and reading the Bible does not, does not make one a Christian. Although these are things that Christians do. Having been born in a Christian family does not identify one as a Christian. Just because you're born within a family that is a Christian does not make a person a Christian. Obeying the law does not count us as being uh, among the redeemed. One becomes a Christian only when that individual confesses that they have sin in their life and need a Savior. They recognize Jesus as their Redeemer and they choose to commit their life to Christ and to Christian living. That is when a person is truly saved. That's when a person truly is a Christian. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is then available to them, to that person. Why are the gifts not manifested through some people? Number two, they have not asked Jesus to baptize them with the Holy Spirit. If the person is a committed Christian, then perhaps all that they need to do is simply ask Jesus to baptize them with His Spirit. 
as we have learned from Scripture, Jesus is the one who baptizes a person with the Holy Spirit. It is not something that man does, like water baptism. We see this in Matthew 3.11. I, John the Baptist, indeed baptize you with water. Baptize you with water unto repentance, unto salvation, you see. Uh, uh, repentance towards salvation. You see. Uh, and that's what John the Baptist did. But... He, and he's referring to Jesus here, but Jesus who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I do not, I am not worthy to carry. Jesus will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The born again Christian can simply ask Jesus to baptize them with the Holy Spirit and receive from Jesus by faith just as they receive their salvation from Jesus by faith. So receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit by faith, just like one receives their salvation from Jesus by faith. In both cases, Jesus is involved. Salvation, and He baptizes you with the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, Jesus speaking in verse 9. Uh, he he I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Verse 13. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So once you have received the Holy Spirit baptism, the Spirit may manifest any of His gifts through you at any time for the glory of God and His kingdom. Why are the gifts not manifested through some people? Number three. Their life does not example Christ. Why would the Holy Spirit give a gift of power to anyone who is not living their life as a Christian? The gifts will bring attention to a person. And if their life example is contrary to the Word of God, that would only hinder the kingdom. That kind of attention would be counterproductive to the kingdom of God if one's life does not example Christ. That person needs to make sure that they are walking the walk and talking the talk. One cannot bluff God. The Holy Spirit who dwells inside of the Christian knows all about them. God knows about me more than I do, for example. He knows how many hairs are still left on my head. And it seems that the counting is getting easier year after year. <laughs> Why are the gifts not manifested through some people? Number four. Perhaps it it is not the will, perhaps it is not the will of the Holy Spirit at this time. All spiritual gifts are distributed as the Spirit wills, not as we desire. I'm going to say that again. All spiritual gifts are distributed as the Holy Spirit wills, not as we desire. It may be simple, uh, sim simply. It may simply be that he chooses not to manifest a gift through a person at this particular time. If one has a clear conscience before God, then relax and let God be God. Allow Him to move through one's life as He desires. My wife, for example cannot show off a necklace from me that I never had given to her. If I never gave her a necklace, there's no way that she can display or show or even wear that necklace. It is the same with spiritual gifts. One cannot make themselves exhibit a gift that was never given to them to be manifested. Just be ready 
because the Christian never knows when the Spirit of Christ may choose to use them to minister to others by His gifting. Why are gifts not manifested through some people? Number five, you're in training. We're all in training. Our whole life we are in training. We're in training for, the, for, for our eternal destination. We're growing in knowledge of how, how to live our life here on planet earth as a Christian. So our whole life we're in training. And so as we go through the training process, you see, sometimes we're ready for things. We're ready for the next step. Uh, maybe we're not ready for the next step. You see, the Holy Spirit is not apt to give a gift to a person if they are not yet ready to handle that gift. Remember, it is power that we are talking about. That's what the gifts are. They're power. The power that will draw both attention and attack. That power will draw attention and it will also draw attack. Attention from people who will listen to what that gifted person has to say. And those words need to proclaim uh, the gospel. People will, all, will also be looking at their life example. So the question is, are you ready for that attention? The power of God upon a person also draws the attention of evil principalities who look for ways of attack in order to derail a Christian's walk with God and discredit their witness. Attacks may try to uh, ruin the Christian, get people angry with them, or even run the Christian out of town. They ran Jesus out of town. They ran Paul out of town. The true gospel many times offends non-Christians around them because the Christian reflects the gospel of Jesus. As my pastor would often say, new level, new devil. So if you get a, a, a gift of the Spirit operating for, through you, then people are going to be <clears throat> perhaps looking at you as an example of Christianity. You get a gift of the Spirit operating through you and it gets the attention of the evil one. And he comes attacking or, or plotting at least towards an attack. A Christian may also find that some of their old friends who are non-believers do not come around as often as they did. The unbeliever can see the difference that Christ has made in their friend's life. And it makes them uncomfortable. Because they are not yet ready for change themselves. Are we ready for the gifts of power? Trust the Holy Spirit on this. Continue your training and be ready for God to move through you. Don't be surprised when he does. Try not to be surprised. <laughs> Although sometimes we are. Because we don't expect it. And all of a sudden, poof. God decides to, to use the, a gift. To minister into the life of somebody. To help someone. To bless someone. Be ready. Continue with your training. Hallelujah. And just let God be God. Relax. Relax. Question. Can a sinner use the gifts of the Spirit? The answer is no and yes. Huh? What, what, what kind of answer is that? I'll explain. We must know that these gifts are only given to Christians. Already mentioned that. Uh, the commitment of one's life to Christ and Christian living is a pre-qualifier. 
Once a Christian has been baptized with the Holy Spirit, potential power by way of the gifts of the Spirit can operate through them as the Spirit desires. It is not up to us as to which gifts operate through us. It's not our choosing since they are distributed by the Holy Spirit as He wills. We cannot make ourselves operate in any of these gifts because they are not ours to activate. They are activated according to the wisdom and knowledge of the, of the Spirit of God. Once a spiritual gift is given to a person, it appears... Now hear this. Start to understand this. Once a spiritual gift is given to a person, it appears to be theirs for the remainder of their life. Once you speak in tongues, for example, you can do that for the remainder of your life. And interestingly, it also appears that even if one falls from grace from the grace of their salvation, that gift that was given still operates through them. Huh? Does that make sense? Well, let's see what the Scripture says. Romans eleven twenty nine, For the gifts, plural, and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. God is not taking the gifts back just because a person returns to a sinful life. Hmm. They are a sinner. They are a sinner indeed if they return back to a sinful life. And if they do not repent, they will find themselves in hell once they pass this life. Destined for hell once they pass this life. But any of the gifts that God gave to them while they were Christians will be theirs all the way to the grave. Any calling upon one's life will remain upon them for as long as they live. Any calling called to be a missionary, called to be a pastor, called uh, whatever God may call a person into. That calling will remain upon them for their life. Even if they turn away from God and discontinue following that calling, the calling does not change. The calling remains. Now David recognized the calling of kingship upon Saul. And he would not intervene to take it by force from Saul, even though he was anointed to replace Saul. He waited for the death of Saul before he took his rightful place. He did not intervene. Even though Saul no, turned out to be a wicked uh, king. Not following after God. God had him anointed as king. And Saul turned, his, uh, turned away from the Lord. And and so God went ahead and he uh, anointed David as king while Saul was still alive. But God, David recognized the calling, the calling of kingship upon Saul and would not intervene to take it by force until Saul himself had died. And not by the hand of David. 
If one is called to be a, mi a missionary, that calling will remain even if the person runs away from God who gave the calling. And we see, we see this biblical example in Jonah who ran from God. But in time, what happened? He repented. And he fulfilled his calling. He went back to his calling. That calling didn't get taken away from him. He still had the calling. He still had the mission assignment by God. That calling. And after he got done with his little rebellious thing, he repented and he went and he fulfilled the calling. He went onward to Nineveh. And that city turned from their wicked ways. And uh, there was healing that, uh, for that city. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This examples why we see people move away from uh, the doctrine of Scripture and into strange doctrine sometimes. <clears throat> And yet, at the same time, continuing to operate in the calling and or the gifts of the Spirit that were given to them. They turn away from God and they start teaching heresy or, or weird stuff that isn't biblical. And you wonder, why are they still able to operate in the gift of the Spirit? Uh, in a particular gift of the Spirit that they've been operating in. You see? And so that explains it. Because God does not take it away. Does not take that gift away. Even though they mess up. There's chance for them. There's hope for them. They may repent and come back to God. And carry on where they left off. To the natural man, this does not make sense. And yet, if you think about it, it does make sense. A gift is a gift. Is it not? A gift is a gift. Once you give out a gift to someone, you do not ask for it back again. Even if they turn sour on you, you don't go asking for that gift back. Even if they, they turn on you. And even if they misuse the gift that you give to them, you don't take that gift back. But know that in the end, God holds us responsible for the spiritual gifts and calling we have been given from Him. We are held accountable by God for each and every gift, each and every calling that He places upon a person. On the day of judgment, everyone will give an account for their works, including their use of, spirit, of any spiritual gift. The gifts are given to profit the body of Christ and for the advancement of the church. And it is our responsibility to use them for such. We have a responsibility, Christianity, to be a bearer of a gift of the Spirit is to carry the responsibility of that gift. I'm going to say that again. To be a bearer of a gift of the Spirit is to carry the responsibility of that gift. This is reflected in Matthew 7, beginning with verse 21. Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
These people were once Christians. They were once believers in God. They once knew Jesus as their Lord. They once used the authority of Jesus' name to cast out demons. The gifts operated through them. But at some point in their life, they chose to turn away from the faith. They relied upon their lingering gifts. You get that? The gifts are not taken away. So what do they do? Some of these people, they, re- they turn their back on God and then they rely upon the lingering gifts and or the calling as assumed proof of their salvation. You have ministers behind the pulpit evangelists preaching and teaching when they should not be because they've fallen away from God. They haven't repented of their sin and they're still answering the calling. They're still answering the calling and they're proclaiming the Word which is not void. It will accomplish what needs to be but the person's not right. They will be held accountable for those gifts. They'll be held accountable for their calling. And so you see they rely upon that lingering gifts and or calling as assumed a proof of their salvation. But their life ceased to bear fruit of Christ's presence. Let me tell you that the only proof of salvation is a life Reflecting the presence of Jesus Christ from within. See, that's the only proof of your salvation is your life reflecting the Christ that is within you. Whenever we support, uh, whenever we purposely, whenever we purposely choose sin over God, we are choosing to sever our relationship with Him and to forfeit our salvation. Whenever we choose sin over God, sin to trump God, we are choosing to sever our relationship with Him and we forfeit our salvation at that point. Anyone in such condition had best repent quickly lest they be found like the biblical five foolish virgins who were left behind when Christ returned. When one severs their relationship with God, it does not matter how much good they have done. It does not matter what great works they have done for God in the past. You see, it doesn't matter what great works you've done, have already done. You see, when, when one severs your relationship, it no longer matters uh, how much good you've done, no matter uh, how many great works you have done, it does not matter how many gifts have operated through them, it does not matter how much faith they had or how long they served God. It is all in the past as explained In Ezekiel 3, verse 20. Ezekiel 3, 20. Again, when a righteous man, a righteous man, when a righteous man turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, commits sin, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he has done, which he has done in the past, his righteousness which he's done in the past, shall not be remembered. That's why in the the Matthew account, uh, the Lord uh, replied to the person, but Lord, we did all these things. We prophesied. We've done many wonders. We cast out demons. And the the Lord, what did he reply? He said, I never knew you. See, it's not remembered. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Because the righteous 
righteousness and good. Because the righteousness and good of the past has been forgotten by God, the backslider is identified as being lawless and is cast from the presence of God for eternity. If they don't repent, if they don't repent and they get before God, it won't matter what they have done. All the good deeds, all the good, all the gifts, all, all the, 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 the following of the calling that they've done. If they turned to sin and away from God, it won't matter. You see, it won't matter any longer. Because the righteousness and the good of the past has been forgotten. And the backslider is identified as lawless and is cast from the presence of God for eternity. What does matter is our current relationship with the Holy Trinity. That's what matters. Not our past relationships. If you blew it, if you messed up in the past, it doesn't matter. If you did great things in the past, you followed God in the past. What matters is your current relationship with the Holy, Holy Trinity. Not your past relationships, not your past faith, nor your past works. God looks upon our heart today, our spiritual heart, our spiritual being, he, uh, our thinking, our mind, our understanding. God looks upon our heart today, our relationship with Him today. We are to respect the anointing and gifts of the Spirit. They are not a game to play. It is serious business being part of the kingdom of God. It's serious business being part of the kingdom of God. As a responsibility that you have to live your life right and to keep it right with God. May we be active in the business of the kingdom, utilizing any gifts, talents, abilities, and treasures that we have been given for His service. Another question. Can I ask for a particular gift of the Spirit? Can I ask for a particular gift of the Spirit? Sure. It is good to desire the gifts of the Spirit in your life. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 12... Verse 31 of 1 Corinthians 12. It says, But earnestly desire the best gifts. That's how that verse begins. Earnestly, earnestly desire the best gifts. Now follow me in this. Because there's rhema. There's understanding that we need to comprehend. It is good to desire the best gifts. You may ask and desire a particular gift. There's nothing wrong with that. But the verse goes on to say, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. He says, desire the best gifts, and yet I'll show you a better way, a more excellent way. What does he mean by that? The more excellent way in summary is love. That Paul goes on to explain in the next chapter. Chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Now if you want to read and grasp the understanding about love as it relates to the gifts of the Spirit. Then, then read chapters 12 and chapter 13. Now of course the motive is to be love. Let your reason. Hello? Let your reason. For seeking any of the gifts be spawned out of love and not out of selfish reasons. In other words, why are you praying and asking for that gift? Is it because of love? Or is it because of selfishness or some other reason? Before you seek a gift, ask yourself, why do I want 
this particular gift. Let the desire for that specific gift be for the purpose of pleasing God. Let it be for the purpose of pleasing God that you're seeking that gift. And for desire to advance the kingdom. Let that be a reason. And for drawing attention to Christ. Not to yourself, but to Christ. And in helping others. All stems from the love of Christ within you. Let it all be stemmed from the love of Christ, that love that's within you for other people. Uh, God's love that's within you being reflected. Let that be the reason why you're seeking a, a particular gift and asking God for a particular gift. If these are truly your reasons for seeking any spiritual gift, then maybe He will consider giving to you the gift that you seek. You can ask for a spiritual gift, but know that the Spirit is not obligated to give the gift to you just because you ask for a specific gift. He's not obligated to give it to you. Why? Because He knows best. Remember, the Holy Spirit is looking out for what will best serve the kingdom. And what will be beneficial for us too. And we ourselves are servants of God. If we're servants of God, we should desire to please Him. If He doesn't want to manifest for some wise reason, then oh, then so be it. For we are but servants. Servants to His calling. Servants to His gifts. We are servants of God. If you ask for a gift of the Spirit, then also ask to be prepared for the gift's manifestation in your life. So you want to be ready for that gift. You don't want the gift to, you know, be an imbalance in your life. You want to be up to the spiritual uh, mentality and and, and uh, uh, stable Christianity to handle the gift that's of power that comes. You don't want to be imbalanced, so you want God to help you be prepared for any of the gifts that He may manifest in your life. So, if you ask for a gift, then ask also to be prepared for. Uh, uh, for that gift. If, you, if you're zeroing in on a particular gift for some reason and let it be spawned out of love as being the motivator uh, and your service to God. Are you ready for whatever that preparation may entail? The gifts are not toys, ladies and gentlemen. The gifts are not toys but heavenly power. Power that requires our responsibility and our respect to be used carefully as we learn to be led by God's Spirit. See, the gifts are to be used as we are led by God's Spirit. They are holy gifts from a holy God. Again, they're not toys of some kind. To play games with. It's serious business. You're handling the power and the anointing of God. You're dealing with that when you when a gift is operating in and through your life. So be wise. Treat it with respect. We will give an account to God for all our gifts, talents, abilities, and even our money that we have been entrusted with. What did we do with each of these during our life? How did we use each? And for what purpose? Moving on. Why did Paul tell us to desire the best gifts? 
He said, desire the best gifts. If you're going to desire a gift, desire the best gifts. Hmm. I'll just let you think for a moment. Why might Paul have said, desire, if you're going to ask for gifts, desire the best gifts? And we read that in 1 Corinthians 12, 31. <clears throat> but earnestly, earnestly desire the best gifts. We must first understand that Paul is not designated, designating some gifts as better than others. I'm going to say that again. Paul here is not designating some gifts as being better than other gifts. It seems that way, but that's not what I believe he's saying. This is where the understanding of the Word comes in. This is the revelation of God's Word. Paul is not designating some gifts as being better than other gifts because all spiritual gifts are perfect within themselves. There's no flaw in the gifts. There's not some that are perfect and some that are not. All spiritual gifts are perfect within themselves because they come from God who is perfect. Just think about it. What gift should we desire? We should desire the gift. Here's the answer. We should desire the gift that would be most beneficial for the moment that we are in. See, as we go about our business of the day, the desired gift is the one that is beneficial for the very moment that we are in. Are you in a moment when the gift of the Spirit would be beneficial? Then that's the gift we are to seek at that moment. Seeking God for that gift. That He may choose to give it to you. For example, if someone should come to you with some disease. They come to you specifically. They have a disease. And they come to you. They do not need you speaking in tongues to them. Or to prophesy future events to them. That's not what they need. What they need at that moment is the gifts of healing to operate through you. We are supposed to be about ministry as Christians. We are to be about ministry, not selfishness. And not after the gift that we want. Oh, wouldn't it be nice if I could use half of that gift, that particular gift? Oh, wouldn't that be great? We are supposed to be about ministry, not selfishness, and not about the gift that we want, and not desiring the gift that we think will make us look good. Those types of thoughts would be more like what the devil would be thinking. We don't want to think like the devil. We want to think more like God, like Christ. Put on the mind of Christ, you see. Learn the mind of Christ. How would Jesus think about the gifts? How did Jesus operate in the gifts? If someone comes to you in need of, of physical health, then what gift do you need to operate through you at that time? We need to ask, seek, and desire God's healing gift to operate through us if healing is what the person needs that we are talking to. We are to desire the best gifts relating to the ministry situation that we are engaged in at the moment. Again, I'm going to say it. We are to desire the best gifts. The best gift or gifts relating to the ministry situation that we are engaged in at the moment. And that ministry changes depending upon whom we are talking to and where we are currently at. 
See, your relationship with Christ is to be a, a living relationship, a walking relationship. You don't say someone that comes to you, oh, let me go pray and seek God for the gift that you need to operate through me. Excuse me, I'll be back in a half an hour. Or maybe it'll be an hour. I don't know how long it will take, you know. No, you don't do that. It's a living relationship where you are there before the person and then you just may silently pray, Lord, minister through me whatever gifts are needed to help that person. Or if you know what gift it is, the gift of healing for this person, Lord. And you may even utter it out, uh, out loud and say, Lord, I pray for the gift of, of healings to, gifts of healing to minister through me as I lay hands upon this person. And you can say that out loud even. And then lay your hand on the person and minister to them. And speak health to that person, you see. <clears throat> and then just trust in the Lord. Let God be God. And you relax. You minister. And then from that point, it's, it's between God and them. You've done your part. You've asked. You've laid hands on. As the scripture says, lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You've done your part. And then it's between God and them. God grants and, and they have to receive. Will they receive? You see, that's up to them. Uh, because God has to work with other people too, you know, with the receivers. They have to be ready to receive. But love is the more excellent way that Paul went on to explain immediately within the same breath following the, uh, uh, following the words about seeking the best gift. We've got to have the right motive, people. 1 Corinthians 12.31 Again, but earnestly desire the best gifts. The best gifts for the moment, you see. And yet, I show you a more excellent way. Let it be because of your love for them, your love for God, and your love for service in His kingdom. The gifts of the Spirit are abilities, giftings, that may come upon a Christian who has been baptized with the Holy Spirit. The nine gifts that God may manifest through the Christian are the Word of Wisdom, which is speaking by the gift of the Spirit, wisdom, or wise advice, to an individual or a group of people. The word of knowledge. This is knowledge about someone that you could not have, have normally known. You wouldn't have known that knowledge about that person. It gets their attention so that you can share the gospel with them or minister to their life. The gift of prophecy which is the foretelling of future events by the power and inspiration of the Spirit of God. Now, this is not fortune telling. It's not tarot cards or the horoscope or Ouija board or clairvoyance. None of those types of things. The gift of faith. Uh, that is a divine gifting of faith for a particular task or event. It is extraordinary faith. But do not confuse this power gift with a measure of faith that God gives to everyone for use, for receiving salvation, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and for faith in the Bible, and for Christian living. The gifts of healing. The gifts of healing is the ability to heal all manner of illness and sickness. Physical as well as emotional and psychological. God does not leave any area undone when it comes to the need of healing. The working of miracles. 
is doing something impossible according to the laws of science, math, or medicine. Like Jesus' miracle of walking on water. The discernment of spirits. Allowing one to recognize not only hidden demons within a person, but also being aware when the work of, of evil is behind a person's conversation or their decisions. Different kinds of tongues is the ability to speak, speak fluently in a language that you have never learned. The interpretation of tongues is the ability to interpret an unknown language that you never that you have never spoken to interpret that language that was spoken by the gift of tongues it is not a translation or it's not a word for word translation of that particular language an unknown language but rather it is an interpretation of its meaning not a translation but an interpretation so let us continue now with more gifts of the Spirit, questions and hang-ups. Why am I able, why am I not able to speak in tongues? Why am I not able to speak in tongues? Before I can answer this, there are a few things that that we must understand. We must know that every born again, spirit baptized Christian has the gifting to be able to speak with tongues for their personal devotional time with God. For their devotional personal time with God they have the ability to speak in tongues. They do not, they do not, do not always uh, uh, use it because of hang-ups or confusion or misunderstanding or deception but they have the ability as seen in Acts 2 verse 4 Acts 2 verse 4 and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance the Holy Spirit gives the words we just have to open our mouth and speak those words in faith. Acts 19, verse 2. Verse 2 of Acts 19, Paul said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? In other words, when you became a Christian, when you received Christ's salvation, did you receive the Holy Spirit at that time? Verse 6, and when Peter had laid hands on them, so they hadn't, and so Peter comes and he lays hands on them, he agrees with them for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And when Peter had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and what happened? And they spoke with tongues and prophesied. We are to understand that there are two uses. Two uses for the gift of tongues. The private devotional use and the group or church use. So personal devotional time alone with God use of the tongues. And the second use is within a congregation in a church in a group setting. The, script, uh, the, the scriptures we just read are examples of the individual, private, devotional use of tongues. But not the gift of tongues that is mentioned uh, during a, a uh, that is uh, manifested during a group or church gathering. Which encourages and benefits others within that group setting. That's what it does. That's what the, the, uh, that's what the uh, group use of the tongues is. The, the church uh, use of the tongues is. Is for encouraging 
others within that group uh, or benefiting others in some way that are within that church. Another individual within the church, maybe the whole churches or, or a group of the people within the church. <clears throat> also these scriptures evidence the private devotional use of the gift of tongues because the gift of tongues was not uh, the gift of interpretation of the tongues was not manifested. So we know that that was the private devotional use of the tongues in, the, in those two scriptures that we read, those two scripture references, because there was no gift of interpretation of the tongues that takes place for group and church edification and instruction. So there was no interpretation of the tongues. So we know that when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they spoke in tongues. That was their uh, personal, private use of the tongues. It did not need interpretation. <clears throat> and so, uh, for the benefit of everyone that was uh, within the congregation. For they all were speaking in tongues when they received the baptism. They all received at the same time. And so they all manifested that gift, that personal use of the gift of tongues. So what is the purpose of the individual private devotional use of tongues? What Value is it? Why, why do we have that ability? Why does the why does God uh, grant that we can have this ability to uh, to use uh, the gift of tongues for our own individual private devotional time? Number one, <clears throat> it allows your spirit, which is in communion with the Holy Spirit. Your spirit's in communion with the Holy Spirit. It allows, the gift of tongue allows your spirit that's in communications with the Holy Spirit to bring to you personally edification and encouragement as recorded in 1 Corinthians 14.4. 1 Corinthians 14.4 He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. Clear and simple. If you speak in tongues, you are edifying yourself. You're encouraging yourself. You're building yourself up. You're stirring your faith up. It edifies you as an individual. The purpose for the individual private devotional use of tongues, number two, it permits the Holy Spirit to offer prayers of intercession through you that you would not know to pray on your own. You may pray and pray as hard as you can, you know, about a situation and you just run out of words. You don't know anything else to say. You've prayed till, you don't, till your mind has no more of knowing what to say. Well, then you can switch over and you can pray concerning that situation that you're praying for. You can pray in tongues. Prayers that pray the perfect will of God. Now that's refreshing. God wants to hear our, our prayers in, in, in our natural language. But when we run out of that, we can switch over and we can know that our prayers are praying the perfect will of God. through that use of the private devotional gift of the Spirit. Because His Spirit and our Spirit are, are in communications. And when that happens, that He's able to give inspiration so that we can speak those words through us uh, that will pray the perfect prayer unto God. Hallelujah. Perfect prayers of intercession. Perfect prayers to God. Now, that's really cool. Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. And we do not know what we should pray. For. So we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, He who searches the hearts, 
and that's God. He who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because the, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He makes intercession according to the will of God. Perfect will of God, as I said. He, uh, uh, we can pray the perfect will of God when we pray in tongues. Next, the purpose for the individual private devotional use of tongues. Number three, it encourages you to offer perfect thanks and perfect worship to God through your yielded mouth. You yield your mouth to perfect thanksgiving and perfect praise unto God. Hallelujah. Your tongue yielded to the unction of the Holy Spirit as, uh, as Paul so communicated on the subject to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians 14. For you indeed give thanks to God well. You give thanks to God well. As you can see, this is a valuable gift that God makes available to each and every Spirit-baptized Christian. Now, to answer the initial question, why am I not able to speak in tongues? Perhaps, number one, perhaps it's doubt. Maybe it's doubt is the reason that you are not able to speak in tongues. Satan hates the gift of tongues and he tries so hard to discredit its value and, you, and its use. Why? So that Christians will not use it. He tries to discredit it and discourage its use so that Christians won't use it. Understand that, that Satan does not want the Christians to engage to uh, be engaged by uh, to be encouraged I mean and enthusiastic made enthusiastic and energized by the encouragement of the spirit of God that comes through tongues he don't want us enthusiastic he don't want us energized satan does not want the christians to pray the perfect prayer of intercession for uh, for themselves and for others. Satan does not want Christians praising God flawlessly. Satan knows that with the gift of tongues we might be encouraged, emboldened, enthusiastic, envisioned in our work for the Lord. We might pray with deeper intensity in spiritual battle. We might become a greater threat to the work of Satan and his kingdom. And so naturally, the use of the gift of tongues is majorly attacked by Satan. He does not want res uh, results this powerful unleashed in the world. You see how important it is? How good it is? If Satan's zeroing in on that, there's a good reason why he's zeroing in on that. It's because there's a lot of value to the gift of tongues. The personal use of the gift of tongues is kind of like the first round of a ladder in which you go up to the other gifts. If your faith gets stirred up, <clears throat> think about it. If your faith gets stirred up, go, uh, you know, you're praying in tongues and you get encouraged and enthusiastic, you stir, uh, your faith gets stirred up. Uh, if your faith gets stir, stirred up, then God may manifest another gift through you. And Satan surely does not want an increase in the gifts of the Spirit. Now sadly, many Christian denominations have believed the deceitful lies of Satan and have minimalized 
the value of this gift and other gifts of the Holy Spirit. And some denominations even deny that the gifts still exist within the church today. How sad it is for those denominations to self-limit the power that God has made available to them. This self-imposed limitation does not make these denominations non-Christians. Okay, even though they put this self-limit on themselves, it does not make them uh, non-Christian, so don't get that idea, but it does hinder their effectiveness in God's kingdom on earth. Now, opposite the private devotional use of tongues is the congregational Use or the group setting when you're in a church setting, okay? So, opposite the private devotional, when you're all alone, use of the tongues is the congregational use of the gift of tongues during a church or group service. So, we are now looking briefly at the congregational use of the gift of tongues in a church service. Once the unknown tongue is spoken, the unknown language is spoken during a church service, it is to be followed by another gift. Another gift of the Holy Spirit known as the gift of interpretation of tongues, which is not a word-for-word translation, as I've mentioned. It's not a word-for-word translation of the unknown tongue that was spoken, but rather an interpretation or an explanation of, of that which was spoken in tongues, which will encourage or inspire someone, perhaps everyone within the church, uh, the, uh, an idea is, is that one may speak in tongues for a minute, but the interpretation that is spoken may last a minute and a half. It may last 30 seconds. It may last three minutes to interpret so that we understand what was spoken in the unknown language. So, uh, in, in a church setting, the use of the gift of, uh, of tongues is that the person will speak in tongues, uh, followed by either the same person or someone else will give the interpretation of what was spoken in that unknown language. Unknown to the speaker, at least. I have heard sometimes where, where uh, instances where someone has spoken in tongues and, and uh, someone else from a, a particular country happened to be in the service that day and they understood that language for what it was, what was spoken. And I've heard that before too. And, uh, and, and so that was, that was really cool. I've never been in one of those services that I recall, but uh, I, I've heard of those cases where people have actually recognized the language that was spoken. Hallelujah. Uh, if a non-Christian is present during this uh, congregational use of speaking in tongues, and its interpretation, the Bible tells us that the gift Actually, these gifts actually serve as a sign. The tongues and the interpretation of tongues it actually serves as a sign to the non-believer, to the non-Christian who happens to be in the service. It's a sign to them that God is real and that He is involved among the pe- among His people, according to First Corinthians, uh, Corinthians fourteen twenty two that you can read. Uh, moving on. Why am I not able to speak in tongues? Number two, another reason might be fear. A person who has trouble being able to uh, come to that point of being able to speak in tongues uh, for their private devotional use might be doubt or it might be fear. 
Some are afraid that they will not be able to speak in tongues. They're so afraid that they're not going to be able to speak in, tr- in tongues. They keep asking, they keep asking, they keep hoping, they keep wanting to, but they're afraid that they're not going to be able to. And others have a fear of speaking uh, of speaking what they do not understand. They don't understand tongues, so they're kind of afraid to speak it. They don't understand the language they're saying. And so they're, they're, they're afraid of what they're going to be saying. Now, let me tell you, Satan capitalizes upon their fear by whispering doubts into their ear. You know, or into their minds, so to speak, into their thoughts. And so he, because he don't want people speaking in tongues. But let us understand that fear is a type of faith. It is a negative faith. Fear is a negative faith. Fear is the opposite of true faith. Fear and faith both respond to your belief and they deliver a result. Fear and faith deliver a result. Fear brings negative results, what you don't want. And faith brings positive results, what you're praying for, what you're hoping for, what you're believing for. That's what faith brings, positive results, while fear brings negative results. So get out of fear. We have no reason to fear that we would not be able to speak in tongues. Don't fear that you can't speak, that you won't be able to speak in tongues. Have faith that you will. And we have no reason to fear our speaking in an unknown language. For it is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Why fear a gift that the Holy Spirit has for you? The Holy Spirit of God. God God gives us salvation and we receive it by faith. His Spirit... God's Spirit gives us tongues and we receive it by faith. Both salvation and tongues we receive by faith. From God, from God's Spirit. Faith for salvation from God and faith uh, uh, for tongues from God's Spirit. Question. Can I speak in tongues whenever I want? The answer to that is no and yes. No, you cannot use the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues in a public group setting whenever you want to. Because that use is given at the will of the Holy Spirit to edify the body of Christ or another person within the church or group? Yes. The other part of the answer is yes. You can speak the devotional use of the gift of tongues any time that you desire. It is for your personal edification and for your prayer and and praise time with God. Now my wife on a night after an anointed service, awoke from her sleep speaking in tongues. She had never spoken in tongues before that night. But now she can speak whenever she wants in her devotional use of the gift. Now let me say that there are times during a church service, for example, that a pastor or, or whoever's leading the service uh, may request everyone to use their devotional use of the gift of tongues to pray for, some, for someone or for some situation. So the pastor may, for example, uh, when someone comes up for prayer and you know they want 
to spend extra time. The pastor may pray for that person, but then he may also call and ask everyone to pray in their language the, the, uh, of the Spirit and pray for that person. And uh, so it's an invitation for everyone to use their devotional use of the gift of tongues for uh, uh, unison prayer for uh, that person. Or there are times when a pastor or song leader may ask everyone to sing using tongues in unison. In unison worship of God, everyone can sing in their private devotional use of the tongue in unison to, uh, uh, to worship God. The translation of each of these types of tongues is not needed. Because its purpose is understood, it's understood within the body, or at least it should be it should be understood within the body that uh, that they are using their their private individual gift uh, for the purpose of praying or in singing unto the Lord or worshiping the Lord together. And it's not a, a particular message uh, the, by the gift of the Spirit for the congregation, you see. And so uh, the difference is understood and that uh, when it's instructed or guided from the pulpit. Question. How do I receive the gift of speaking in tongues? How do I receive this gift of speaking in tongues? Number one, ask. Just simply ask and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you have to be a Christian. Only Christians can receive this baptism of power upon them. This power comes upon them. If one is not a Christian, then simply ask and receive salvation before, uh, before asking for spirit baptism. Get saved and then ask for the spirit baptism. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within a person at the moment of their salvation. To dwell and live and reside within the person during uh, right after they, they invite um, Christ into their life. So during their salvation, uh, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within. But if they are seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit, uh, it is Jesus who baptizes them with the Holy Spirit, not man. And the power of the Spirit baptism comes upon the person. Not within them, but upon the person. If you are already a Christian, then simply ask Jesus for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Once you receive the Spirit baptism, you will be able to speak with tongues for your devotional private usage. You may actually never end up giving a, a spoken word in tongues in a congregation as uh, uh, just you speaking and then having someone interpret. You may never do that. But you, will, you may or may not. It's up to the Holy Spirit for that gift. But for the devotional, private use, you uh, once you've received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will be able to speak in tongues. It's available for you to do so. So get past any fears or any unbeliefs that you may have and, and know that it is good and that it is from God for our benefit. If you have already received the Holy Spirit baptism but have not yet spoken in tongues, then simply ask for the ability to speak in tongues in faith. In faith ask. Now, how do I receive the gift of speaking in tongues? Number two. First you ask and receive. And number two, you open your mouth and speak. You don't open your mouth and speak, then nothing's going to come out. If I came up here and I just stood, you aren't going to be reading my mind. 
If I just stood and didn't say a word, nothing's going to come out. Wouldn't be much of a message, would it? Wouldn't be much of a sermon. So we got to speak it. Open your mouth and speak. We are to just open our mouth and choose decision, power of decision. In faith, you open your mouth and choose to speak the sounds that come. You speak English by the inspiration of your thoughts. By inspiration of your own thoughts, you speak English or whatever language it is that, that's, that, that you're used to. You speak in tongues by inspiration also. But not inspiration of your thoughts. You speak by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You speak in tongues by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Simply open your mouth and choose to speak, trusting that the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. All language is made up of little syllable sounds. Uh, some we understand and some we do not understand. I do not understand the sounds of the Japanese language, for example. It sounds strange and odd to me. But it is a real language. It is made up of little syllables just like English. And the Japanese, many of them won't understand the English. Because it sounds strange to them. But no matter what language... It is. It's made up of little syllable sounds. When you speak in tongues, speak until uh, the inspiration is complete. So you see, tongues is made up of syllable sounds too. And so you speak until, uh, and then once you start speaking in tongues, speak until uh, the, uh, the inspiration of that speaking is complete. Otherwise, you may be cutting it off in mid-sample, uh, uh, mid-sentence. Uh, uh, For example, if I were to speak these, uh, these English syllables, the weather is nice today. Well, actually, it's not. It's cloudy and snowy. I think there was a little bit of snow out there, but at least cloudy. But uh, for the, the example here, the weather is nice today. That is a complete sentence. But if I say, the weather is, and just stop talking, the sentence and the thought is incomplete. Same idea with tongues. So pray until the, until the inspiration is complete. Now you can also start and stop, speak, in English any time you want. The same with tongues. For example, So you see, just the same with tongues. You can stop and start at any time. God is the author of language. The language of heaven. He understands all languages and He can gift to, uh, gift to us any language that He desires. And that which I just spoke in tongues does not need example. It's the use of my private uh, uh, language for example for you to hear how that you can stop and start at any time. Now tidbits about tongues. We do not have to understand the meaning of what we speak in tongues during our private prayers, our private devotional use of that gift. We don't have to have an interpretation. No interpretation is needed then. But sometimes the Spirit will give you an understanding uh, interpretation if He de uh, determines you need to know. 
But most of the time, it is not really necessary for us to know what we had just prayed and praised during our personal private time of tongues. Just knowing that God ministered to us and through us is awesome. Now, we can talk in English. Father, I praise your name. I glorify you. We can whisper in English. Father, I praise you. And I glorify you. We can shout in English. Father, I praise you. I praise you, Father. I glorify you. Or we can sing in English. Father, I praise you. And so forth. The same with tongues. I can talk in tongues. I can whisper in tongues. I can shout in tongues or I can sing in tongues now you see you can do all that with tongues just like you do with English or whatever language you speak normally it's all syllables and sounds and it's the gifting of the Spirit that enables you, uh, the baptized in the Holy Spirit person, to be able to do. Note that if your singing in, Eng- in English does not sound in tune, if you don't sing good in English, if you're out of tune, you can't carry a tune, then it probably will, will not sound good in tongues because it is, not a gif- it, it is not a gifting of voice. It's a gifting of language. But praise the Lord, hallelujah, once we get to heaven, all will be made perfect there. Hallelujah. Your voice will be perfect in harmony and in tune in heaven. Hallelujah. For those of you who struggle with the tunes. Hallelujah. We've got something great to look forward to. Hallelujah. So, our, it's a gift of language. It's not a gift of voice. Question. Why do some people fall to the floor during church services? Why do they fall during, to the floor during church services or sometimes when they're being prayed for? Well, here we go. Let's look at Scripture. Around Easter time, I once delivered a message of the events that took place in the Garden of Gethsemane according to the Gospel of John. In short, a mob and soldiers carrying weapons came to take Jesus by force. It could have been a disaster at that moment, but the anointing came upon, the anointing came upon the whole crowd of people with no one touching them. Nobody touched the people in the crowd, but the anointing came as a result of the anointing that came, as a result, the mob, the soldiers, and even the disciples of Jesus, they all fell backwards. Read it for yourself in the book of John, in the Garden of Gethsemane. The mob, the soldiers that came to arrest Jesus, and the disciples, they all fell backwards to the ground, bringing control for a volatile situation. It brought control to a volatile situation. We must understand that the anointing of God is potent. It is powerful. It's a power. The anointing of God. The presence of God. He is holy. We were unholy. And those who are not uh, saved and their, and their sins have not been forgiven, they are unholy. We were unholy, saved and redeemed by Christ. God is holy in His holy presence, His glory, His power comes within that glory. 
when he uh, enters a room by his spirit. And when it is released within a congregation, when that anointing, that power is released within, and that power is present within a congregation, one, two, or scores of people may possibly fall to the floor, unable to stand because of the invisible potency uh, and holy presence in the midst of the congregation. The anointing is also uh, sometimes released through a uh, through people upon uh, upon other people. For example, uh, by the touch or by uh, a shadow's length, as the anointing radiates, uh, so to speak, out uh, a certain distance beyond you. It radiates around you. The anointing, the power of the presence and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And so sometimes people are affected by someone laying their hands on them by that anointing and that power. Or the shadow's length as you walk near a person and someone may fall. You put your hand on someone, they may fall to the ground because the anointing is potent and it's powerful. It's the anointing of the presence of the Holy Spirit ministering to people and at work amongst the congregation. People under the anointing are not knocked down. They're not pushed down. They just simply fall because the anointing presence of the Spirit is too potent for their body to handle. And they just can't handle standing anymore. People who for whatever reason fake fall. That's what I call it. Fake fall. Faking a fall. People who for whatever reason fake fall down will sometimes get hurt. There is no reason to fake a fall. Let me say that. There's no reason to fake a fall. If you never fall, that's okay. You don't have to fall to the, to the, uh, to the ground or to the floor to receive from God. Don't fake it. You might get hurt. There's no reason to. It does not prove anything. It only endangers the person's health. People, people who truly fall under the power or because of the power anointing, the power presence of the anointing, they are never harmed. If it's not a fake fall and their body falls because of the presence of God upon them, the presence of the uh, anointing of the Holy Spirit upon them, then they are not harmed. I have never in my life seen anyone get hurt who has fallen under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now here's, here's an example. I personally was in a service... There was a crowd of people in front of me. I was a ways back, so there was nobody here for a ways. I was back further. We were at a camp type thing. It used to be called Jesus Festivals. And so I was at the back of the crowd. And there was quite a distance, quite a distance uh, from that crowd. And, and me and two, at least two other people were with me, one on each side. And we were standing there. And uh, as the service was uh, continuing, and when I, uh, when suddenly a line, a row within the crowd began to fall. I saw it was almost like a straight line uh, starting to fall from the front towards the back of the row. I mean uh, the crowd, from the front of the crowd to the back of the crowd, uh, almost in a straight line or straight row, coming back. <clears throat> Suddenly the anointing power came upon me, and I fell from the standing position, as I'm standing now, from a standing position, I fell backwards upon a concrete floor. 
I felt absolutely no pain in falling or afterwards, and no soreness of any kind from the fall. Because God's anointing also protects. You better not be fake falling onto the floor. You could get hurt. People just have accidents and trip and fall and get hurt. Some very badly. So you don't want a fake fall. If you fall, you want to fall because of the anointing in the presence of God. And you'll have the divine protection over you in that fall. That being said, it is still wisdom for churches to use so-called catchers behind people who are being prayed for. And, and so if you pray for somebody, it's good to either have them near a seat where if they should fall under the power, or, do, or more so, if they should fake fall. This is the reason. If they fake fall, they have them near a, a seat. So if they fall, they'll fall into a chair and hopefully not get hurt. But if you have a catcher, a person who's standing behind them, in case they do fall, and especially if it's a fake fall, can catch them and lay them down gently. <clears throat> because we do, we do not know the thoughts of those that we are praying for. That's why we want to have catchers in church. There are kooky and confused people that are out there. People who who, you know, whatever their rationale is, they may fake fall. And we do not want someone to fake a fall and get hurt. Sometimes it's just their misunderstanding. For whatever reason, they think they have to fall in order to receive from God. That might be their thinking. I, who knows? Who knows? They're, sometimes they're just confused or ignorant or kooky people. And so we do not want someone to fake a fall and get hurt. We care about the welfare of people. Now... Do I, here's another question, do I have to fall to the ground? Do I have to fall under the power in order to receive from God? I'm like, I answered that in part already just a few statements ago. The answer is absolutely not. You do not have to fall under the power. You do not have to fall uh, to the ground or to the floor in order to receive from God. People sometimes fall to the ground and do not receive. Sometimes they do. People sometimes stay standing when they're prayed for. For example, they stay standing and they do not receive. Sometimes they do receive and they stay never did fall. They, st they, they stood the whole time. The reason why people receive sometimes when they fall, sometimes they don't. The reason why sometimes they receive when they're standing and sometimes they don't receive when they're, uh, when they're standing. The reason is because we receive by faith. We receive by faith, not by falling. Your falling doesn't make you receive. Your falling doesn't make you even a candidate for receiving. It's faith. Faith is the key. We receive by faith. We people only fall to the ground because our bodies cannot handle such power that comes upon us. Uh, from time to time that may happen. It is not by falling that we receive, but rather it is the activation of our faith. Turn your faith on people when you're being prayed for and receive whether you fall or not. Receive by faith. It is the activation of faith that God has given to each of us that delivers to us the answer that we seek. Wow! It's the faith that God has given to each of us 
that delivers to us the answer we seek. Remember, He gives a measure of faith to everyone. He gives to everyone a measure of faith. We've got to activate it. we got to turn it on. When you go to be prayed for, turn your faith on. Turn your faith on. Hallelujah. Uh, that's a key word here, I think, today. Turn your faith on. Be that for health, a miracle, or an, or an answered prayer request. Turn your faith on. <clears throat> Matthew 9, 22. And Jesus saw her faith. And, and said, Jesus saw her and he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith. You're falling? No, he didn't say you're falling. He says your faith has made you well. <clears throat> Matthew 9, 29. Let's look at another example. Then he touched their eyes, <clears throat> saying, According to your falling... No, not, a call, not according to your falling. According to your faith, let it be to you. Your faith will determine if you get healed or not. He said, according to your faith, let it be to you. Matthew 15, verse 28. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman... Great is your faith. It's faith that we need. Not our falling. You may fall because of the anointing that's upon you is greater than your body can handle and it falls under the wonderful presence of God. <clears throat> but you've got to activate your faith whether you're laying on that ground or whether you're still standing. You've got to activate that faith. Oh woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. Her desire because of her faith was fulfilled that day. These people got what they wanted because of their faith in Jesus' ability. They got what they needed because of Jesus' ability. Faith in it. Not just His ability, but faith in His ability that, that they can receive from Him. Faith in it. Faith works the same today. Believe and receive. Believe and receive. It is our use of the gifts of God's gift of faith. It's our use of God's gift of faith that meets our need. <clears throat> it is not our effort that meets our need, and nor our falling that, to the ground or to the floor that meets our needs. Uh, it's not the, the, these. The, it's not our effort and not our falling that brings healing <clears throat> or deliverance or an answer to prayer. It is faith and faith alone. Excuse me. <clears throat> when reading your Bible, exercise your faith in the words and receive from it. Discover in there what's for you. And exercise your faith for it. If we should fall under the power of the anointing during a church service, then exercise faith in the presence of the anointing and receive from it. Faith is the focal point in both cases. Faith is the focal point. Jesus went, uh, went from town to town. In some towns, healings. Now listen to this. He went from town to town. He didn't stay at the same place. He visited one village after another. From town to town. <clears throat> In some towns, healings and great miracles and deliverances took place. But, in other towns... The Bible tells us that Jesus did not do many works there. 
He didn't do many miracles. He didn't do many healings. He didn't do many uh, deliverances there in some towns because of their lack of faith. Let's see it. In the Word, Matthew 13, 58. Matthew 13, 58. Now Jesus did not do. He didn't. He did not do what? He did not do many mighty works. Healings, miracles, deliverances. He did not many mighty works there at that town. Why? Because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Jesus did not do many works because of their unbelief. The problem was not Jesus' ability. The problem was not Jesus' ability. The same power anointing was upon Jesus no matter which town He entered. You see, no matter which town He entered, the same power anointing was upon Jesus. The problem was that the people did not exercise their faith that God gave to everyone. Everyone He gives a measure of faith to. They did not exercise their faith that God, that God gives to everyone. And so they did not receive. Many did not receive. So, my challenge to you to stay is have faith. As it says in Mark 9.23 Jesus said to him, If you can believe, if you can believe, all things, not some things, all things are possible to him who believes. It does, there's no limit on that. Faith, you see. All things that will not conflict with Scripture, all things that will not conflict with Scripture are possible unto you. Have faith. Have faith. I hope this has answered at least some of your questions about the gifts of the Spirit. Now any time you have a question, simply ask God who is able to explain what you need to know and at the right time you need to know it. Well, I want to thank each and every one of you for watching today and I trust that the message ministered into your life. Now, I want to give an opportunity to those of you who may have never committed their life to Christ, you have the opportunity to do so right now, to become a Christian. And how do you do that? Well, this instruction manual called the Bible tells us exactly what to do. In Romans 10, uh, verse 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that, uh, uh, in other words, believe with your being, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And here it is. Whoever, verse 13, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hallelujah. If that's you today, then I ask that you'll go ahead and you'll bow your head right with, along with me. And when, and when I say a phrase, you repeat it where I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And if you believe what you are saying, if you mean it from your heart, from your being, then you will become a Christian. You will be on your way towards heaven. Hallelujah. So let's, let's pray. Just repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I come to you right now in the name of Jesus.
First of all, Lord, I ask that you'll forgive me for all my wrongdoings. Forgive me for all my sins. And Lord, I ask that you will come into my life. For I want to be a Christian. Lord, I commit myself to you. I commit myself to living a Christian life. And I thank you for such a great salvation. Thank you for what Jesus did for me on the cross. That he died for me. And he rose again, victorious. That I can live a Christian life. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness of sins. Hallelujah. Thank you. Now, if you prayed that prayer today, then you're a Christian. Now, there's three important things that as believers that we need to do. And number one is to talk with God every day. It's called prayer. Just talk with Him about anything and everything that you're uh, concerned about or, or have questions about. Your happy moments, your sad moments, just share with Him. And, uh, and when you do pray to Him, when you do talk to Him, uh, give a little bit of time, a little bit of moment in your prayer time uh, to listen. Because He may have something to say to you that day. Uh, and from time to time, he, he may. And so listen for His response. Don't just give Him your list of things that you would love to have Him do and, and, and that. But also thank Him. Thank Him for what He has done in your life. So spend some time thanking Him as well. Uh, number two, I would say, is read the Bible. Read it often. It's our uh, success manual. Successful uh, for succeeding in our walk, our Christian walk. Our, our Christian success manual. And uh, so read it often. And when you get ready to read it, go ahead and, and say a little prayer to God, asking Him to help you to understand it. It's not so much how much we read. It's more important that we understand, even if it's the little that we read. Uh, that's what's important about reading the Word. Because He helps lead us and guide us and train us and teach us. He helps us to know, understand who He is, how He operates, how heaven operates as we read the book. And uh, lastly, attend church. Find a Christian church and attend there. And uh, eventually become involved in that church and help that church to grow. Help, uh, uh, because that's what the church is, does for you. It helps you to mature in your Christian walk. You get support there from other believers that, will, that can encourage you in your faith. And you get to hear the message being explained to help you understand what, the, what Christianity is about, what the Bible's about, and how God operates. And so, attending church is very important to a Christian's health, uh, spiritual health. And uh, so, do those things and enjoy, enjoy the journey of your Christian walk. Welcome to the kingdom.